Hi, this is Jack Stanley, and I want to talk more on uh, some of the things done in the factories, making the old machines and stuff like that. You know, there's something that we don't think of as well as we look at the various machines, especially the Victor ones. The Victor ones are beautiful pieces of, of, of workmanship. Of course, they're all veneered. A lot of times we don't realize that, but they're not solid wood. They have, uh, they have uh, core woods underneath, usually like oak, but then they would be covered with uh, mahogany or, or circassian walnut or whatever it may be. And all of this was put together and worked on and polished with seaweed. And, and uh, the seaweed was good. It filled in the pores of the wood, of course. Uh, another thing is, if you go through the papers of the Victor Company, it's pretty fascinating. I remember going to the museum in, in Delaware, and they have so much information there. And also, um, in the David Sarnoff Library, there's other information there. And talking about some of the, the various machines and recipes and things for uh, making the machines and records. but. All of these machines, as I said, they were made of uh, various veneers, which all had to be glued together and put in kilns and aged and prepared. And in all of these facilities running through this massive area of the Victor plant in Camden, New Jersey, were tubes of hot glue, hot animal hide glue. And I have to tell you something, there's hardly anything in the world that smells as bad as that hot glue. It was a terrible smelling glue and that was all that permeated the Victor plant. Another thing that we forget to think of is in the pressing plants, of course, they were pretty smelly. That whole setup and a lot that material cooking, the shellac and the, the graphite and hard rubbers all mixed together um, was a pretty smelly affair. Another thing is, I remember talking to a fellow by the name of Gurdon Mayfield, and uh, he had worked as a mailboy at the Edison Company in the 1920s. And one of the things that he had to he had to walk the entire complex, which was monstrous in those days. And he used to tell me that some of the worst smells that he ever smelled were in the record production building. He said it was very hot, very smelly, you know, because they were all making these condensite, you know, diamond discs. And, you know, this is all heavy chemical smells and pretty nasty. But he said it was very, very foul smelling. And even when I talked to him in the 1990s, he would just kind of shudder and talk, think of that smell, how bad it was. You know, other things to, to mention to you as well is, is another thing is pirating. Pirating was going on too, and it was going on by lots of companies. Let's be honest, Victor copied stuff from Columbia. Columbia stuff copied stuff from Victor. Um, he had a bunch of these smaller concerns that were making records and machines that were using patents of other companies that uh, obviously shouldn't have been used. You know, you had um, you know, Leeds and Catlin. And they had these gold foil records, which were beautiful, but totally illegal. <laughs> and they just kept changing labels. And, uh, and eventually, by around 1910, they're out of business. But they copied from everybody. And there's, you know, there's dubs, there's copies, there's... You know, the Busy B discs, they didn't make any of their records. Their, the label was just put on records. Uh, and, of course, you've got to remember Columbia. Columbia, which was in Bridgeport, Connecticut, um, initially had been in other areas. They had actually been in, um, in New Jersey for a little while because they were dealing with the, uh, <coughs> the Burt Company in Milburn, New Jersey, and that's where a lot of the Columbia records, 
And of course, we know that the early Climax records were made. Also turns out that's where a number of other records were stamped, including Victor's for a little while. Um, <laughs> so eventually they moved to Bridgeport, but Columbia did something very interesting, and I'm sure many of you know this, uh, that they had a massive stock of records that had been made since 1901 if it didn't have an announcement on the beginning, or even if it did have an announcement, all you needed was some tools and you could erase from the matrix, from the stamper, uh, the announcement. And uh, then you could sell these recordings to secondary companies. I mean, think of how many Columbia records are on countless different labels. And you know, the amazing part of this is that a lot of those records that were put out in the 1920s that came from Columbia, some of them went back to 1902. And they just had the announcement erased. Of course, the method of making multiple stampers uh, was developed in 1902. And, and by that point, Columbia and Victor more or less were doing that. Um, other things that's uh, kind of interesting as well is I'm thinking of the massive amount of train networks they needed. You know, you think about the tens of millions of records. It's kind of hard sometimes when you think about it, you know, how many, how many records were being made by the companies. We're talking in the the millions. That's a lot. Of course, when we go back to the beginnings, like the when we go back to the Consolidated Talking Machine Company with Eldridge Johnson, they made a couple of thousand. And of course, in 1900, 1901, they made several hundred thousand. But by 1902, they had gone well over into the millions. And as you go along, I mean, it just keeps jumping up and up. And if you look at the business and the amount of records being made, you know, by the, you know, the, the late teens, I mean, when you reach like 1920, I mean, we're talking, you know, tens of millions of records being made, which is incredible. You know, that's why you find them everywhere. There was so many of them made, at least of that period. The stuff from the early days is quite hard to find. You know, one other thing to mention, too, you know, everything's mechanical. The recording in the early days was all mechanical. There was no electronics. There was no electricity. There were no microphones. You know, things were done by horn, by acoustic methods. And I want to get into detail about recording um, another day. But think about it, the machines to play back were purely mechanical. And there's a reason for it. I would say probably in 1905, almost every house around, except for a handful, was lit with gas. You didn't have massive electricity in houses. Some of the cities had them, but you get out of a big city. And even like New York City, that was only partially lit with electric power. And of course, mainly um, in business areas, in all these factories for the phonographs, that was all DC. Um, but it wouldn't be well until like the 1920s that many, many places became electrified. And to be perfectly honest, when it comes to electrification of the United States, and I'm not going to talk about other parts of the world because I'm not totally aware of that, but one of the major f focuses of electric lighting throughout the United States was during the time of the Great Depression. You had WPA programs in which uh, electric wires were laid and connecting cities and areas and small towns, and that's when a lot of the gas lighting vanishes and the kerosene lamps vanish. And of course, all the wind up phonographs because, well, you didn't have the electric power. And after 1925, 
when the electrical process comes along with records, then you start seeing all the machines because they have radios and everything else. And the wind-up machine becomes relegated to portables that could be taken to a beach or something like that. And that becomes the standard until the 1950s. So, another little talk here on ramblings on, uh, on records, on manufacture and stuff like that. I'll do a few more of these as I think of things. There's, there's so many different things because, you know, you mention one thing and it reminds you of a hundred different other things. It's what happens when you study this long enough and you've got all these things stuck in your recesses. It's sort of like, a, like an English muffin. You'll have the nooks and crannies and things are hidden in there. And all of a sudden, with a certain thought, a memory that hasn't been thought of in ages is suddenly reawakened. And uh, that's always cool. But it is important to remember all the stuff that was done in the factories. Hot hide glue. All the massive DC uh, electrical systems. And of course all the steam systems. Uh, all the various power systems that made records, made machines. And took us a notch higher in the world of technology.